Hello, my name is Angela, and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members have access to exciting opportunities through their involvement with the Institute. This includes volunteering at evening programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will come to you with the microphone. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off or silence your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Gerges, Deputy Director of the Department of Military History. Thank you, Angela. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. Um, this is a real pleasure for me. Uh, I get to introduce a friend and a colleague that I've known for many years. Um, and for all of you who have not um, seen John speak before, he's a real powerhouse in the department. Um, he is a full professor of military history um, at the Department of Military History. He um, first came to the college where he was a part of the Navy detachment, uh, then taught up in JMO, and then um, retired um, in 2004 at the rank of commander uh, after 23 years where he had served in the Navy as a, a Navy flight officer flying land and carrier-based aircraft. So he may know something about um, the War of the Pacific and, and naval operations. Um, he served in our department as the Major General William Stoff Chair for Historical Research. We have one chair that we dedicate uh, to a senior faculty member so they give them more time to research and, and, and focus on, on their writings. He also um, was the Fleet Admiral Ernest J. King Visiting Professor of Mar Maritime History at the Naval War College uh, from 2020 to 2021. Uh, John's taught a, t a variety of subjects from prepping military history while he's been at the Commander General Staff College. Um, he's also written uh, books, Agents of Innovation, a Military History of Japan from the Age of Samurai to the 21st Century, Napoleonic Warfare, the Operational Art of the Great Campaigns, and um, the, the America's First General Staff, and he co-authored co Eyewitness Pacific Theater. So he has a wide range of interests. Um, he's also uh, written numerous articles and editorials and awarded the Moncato Prize for the S Society of Military History. His latest book is coming out from Prager, and, or just came out from Prager, and it's The 100 uh, Worst Military Disasters. So no further ado, John Kuhn. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Thanks for coming out, everybody. I, I appreciate you uh, coming. I, this is going to be a really fun uh, episode. It, it was actually supposed to take place on the 7th of April, but I got a really, really bad cold and lost my voice, so we had to reschedule. So I appreciate the Dole Center's flexibility, and I thank the Dole Center and, and the supporters of the Dole Center and, and you all for, for being out. All right, well, victory at sea. This is, this is really a lecture about two things, but the primary thing it's a lecture about is one of the most successful information operations in history, all right, or in, in modern history, that utilized mass communications, that utilized this new medium of television and mass communication. So it's not really a, the, it is film, but it was film that was captured and, and presented on this new medium of television, which, had, which was a very, very new technology. So, so this was all cutting edge stuff when it came out. Uh, it'd, it'd be like Elon Musk, you know, uh, a broadcasting from Mars on cosmic rays or something like that. That's, that's what the, the, the technology piece of this was like. Well, uh, so there's going to be two parts of this. I'm going to kind of give you the context, then tell the story about how they put the story together. Then we're going to do the fun part. We're going to look at the, at the, at the film clips uh, from this magnificent documentary that uh, was produced by, uh, by the NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Make sure I can view this. All right, so I talked about that, yeah. Well, the war in the Pacific, um, normally when we think of victory at sea, we think of the Pacific, 
don't worry, we're going to get the other ocean in there too. And actually, the Indian Ocean was a part of it, and you can see the Indian Ocean o over here. So the Indian Ocean played a big role. But, but, but victory at sea is really about history's most all-encompassing, globe-spanning maritime war. And we call it World War II, all right? We call it World War II. But th th never before in the history of mankind had so much combat been occurring in so many bodies of water at the same time. Uh, every body of water in the world, including the Caribbean, had warfare in it. Uh, the Arctic, the Baltic, the Black Sea, the Med, even the Red Sea, you know, there, there, was, there was warfare on all the seas of the world, okay? So this is the Pacific piece. This is actually uh, one of the versions of the famous War Plan Orange that the Navy developed to fight the war in the Pacific should they ever go to war with Japan. This is the other theater, uh, and again, I, I used an old slide for the Z plan, which was the German plan to strangle Great Britain beginning in about 1944, if she went to war with Great Britain in 1944. Of course, she went in 1939. But so we're gonna, so we'll see, Victory at Sea will actually start in this ocean, and then we'll kind of go over to this ocean. So we'll see how the, it moves around. Um, and, I, and I'll talk to a little bit more about how it was put together after we've talked a little bit more about the context here. All right, and again, that global piece, there's warfare all across this, this, this expansive maritime uh, environment beginning in 1939. And again, a lot of this has to do with shipping. Uh, shipping was all important in World War II. Uh, Essentially, the nations that could maintain control of the shipping lanes and put their stuff on ships, get it back to their industrial bases, and produce the sinews of war, tanks, airplanes, trucks, oil, bauxite, aluminum, uh, nitrates, explosives, and then, of course, train men and put them on those ships and get them to the theaters op op of operation in a global war were probably going to be the nations that won. So it was very much a maritime war. Probably one of the most maritime, if not the most maritime, war in the history of mankind. Uh, you could almost say that the war at sea was every bit as important as war on land. For most of military history, that's not the case. What happens on land overshadows, in most cases, what's going on at sea. But that was not true in World War II. And again, the types of ship varied. I mean, you had, uh, you had uh, jeep carriers, destroyer escorts, floating dry docks, battleships, liberty ships, submarines, destroyers. And again, you saw those merchant ships. So every kind of ship that you can imagine of every kind that was uh, involved, all right? Uh, and, and, and the environments that they flew in, in the air, in the jungles, uh, flying, flying ships, if you will, flying boats, uh, amphibious ships that could roll on and roll off the beaches, underway replenishment, two, two warships at a time. This is, this is all stuff that's really familiar to sailors today because this still looks like, so warfare then still looks a lot like warfare today. And then, of course, the murderer's row of carriers. By the way, this is Ulithia Toll which is, uh, some people say it's in the Western Carolines, other people like me say it's in the Northern Palau's, but this is in the Western Pacific. Huge, huge uh, anchorage there. All right, well, let's talk about it. So it captured American imaginations, but after World War II, a funny thing happened. The, uh, the Navy that had fought and prosecuted this war, or rather I should say the navies because we're talking about the Allied navies here, were almost universally downsized, essentially demobilized. Um, and the U U.S. fleet was no accident. But the imagination was still captured by all these events in World War II. And, and in the early 50s, with the outbreak of the Korean War, interest in things maritime emerged again. There was this short period after World War II where there were certain people in the government, Hoyt Vandenberg, Carl Spatz, guys like that, who were saying that sea power was obsolete. Yeah, you still need ships as bulk cargo carriers, but warships are obsolete because of nuclear bombers. And so, so the Navy kind of, you know, did this fantastic, amazing 
job, the navies, the Royal Navy and the American Navy, because the Royal Navy, Navy is going to be in a lot of these clips that we're going to see, is um, they, they, they kind of lost their narrative footing with the publics because after World War II, you know, the world needed to be rebuilt. And so the narrative kind of got lost a little bit. But with the, uh, with the outbreak of the Korean War and the intensification of the Cold War, uh, some really bright people in Hollywood, of all places, said, hey, let's get this story out to the American people. And so Victory at Sea was really a Cold War operation. It's like, hey, maybe we can tell this story of a global war against an ideology, fascism, communism, and how it took a long time, and it was protracted, and it required effort, sustained effort, it required maritime power, but in the end, freedom and democracy prevailed. And so that's the narrative that they wanted to present, all right? And it was almost the perfect storm for this narrative to be created and then given to the American people via mass media. Now, the mass media of the day, and I was talking to the guys about it in the back, was radio. Radio was how you got the message out, right? I mean, Papio Daniel, we're mass communicating now, right? So, so mass media. But they wanted to use a new technology that the National Broadcasting Company uh, had called television. And television was just starting to become ubiquitous in the United States. And, uh, and so what they wanted to do was broadcast uh, this footage, all of this sort of unprocessed World War II footage, much of, much of, much of, much of it was taken during the war to, to create propaganda and information videos that people would go watch during the war. You know, they'd go to see Casablanca, and, but prior to that, they'd see a newsreel, right? So a lot of that, but a lot of that footage, nobody ever saw. There were 60 million feet of unprocessed film footage that people had not seen. Now, um, so that's the context. That's the context. So who's the genius behind all this? All right? Henry Pete Salomon. I'm going to show you here in a second. Let's talk about who Henry Pete Salomon was. He served in Navy public relations during the war, so he knew about the film crews that were on the ships taking these uh, films during the war. And he helped put together some of those propaganda and information and newsreel vi videos that, that, that some Americans saw during World War II. He also assisted Samuel Elliott Morrison with the production of Morrison's semi-official history of the United States Navy in World War II. So, so not only did he kind of know the PR side and the production side of the business, but he also knew the historical side of the business because he's hanging out with a Harvard award-winning historian you know, uh, uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison, who'd won all sorts of prizes, including a Pulitzer Prize. So, so, so he assisted Morrison with those. And, and then he decided, I'm going to take my skills as a screenwriter or a script writer, because he was a really good writer, and I'm going to write the narration. And he became the de facto producer. Now, if you're a producer, what does that mean? That means money. So he had to go get money, or he had to get some buy-in. And he was very innovative in the way he decided to pitch this. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the National Broadcasting Company. I'm going to say, listen, all of the production is complete. The film has already been shot. You need two things. You need editors, you need airtime, and you need music. Okay? Uh, and, and, of course, somebody to read the script, right? Somebody... Somebody really with a great voice, right? And so, uh, so he went and he actually got Richard Rogers to write the, write the uh, music for, the, for uh, the background music. And we're gonna, that's the clip we'll start with when we finally start so you can get a feel for that. You'll recognize the music immediately. If you don't recognize it immediately, I've now got it in your brain and later on you will recognize it immediately. He also said, hey, you know, one way he saved production costs was no ads and no income for the initial run. And NBC bought into this. Some bright Madison Avenue person, probably, you know, from across the street, right, working at Rockefeller Center, said, hey, you know, uh, this is a really great way for us to generate interest in television as a medium 
and it's a great way to get our product out there. And then once we do that initial run, we can sell this in syndication to local stations if it's successful. They took a big risk. They took a big risk. The other thing was they needed somebody to arrange uh, Rogers' music. So instead of putting Rogers' picture up there, Richard Rogers, Rogers and Hammerstein, South Pacific and everything, it's, yeah, I mean, it's so appropriate, right? You're going you're gonna to do a war about Navy warfare, much of it in the Pacific, and you're going to get the guy who helped write South Pacific. But they took this guy, Russell, uh, Robert Russell Bennett. He's the conductor of the uh, National Broadcasting Company Orchestra that's going to play the music you're going to hear. And he arranged a lot of that music. So I actually found that Bennett, this Kansas City native, was more important in terms of the overall music. Yes, Rogers was the genius behind the melodies and everything like that, but the actual arrangements were Bennett. And, and I mean, if you know anything about music, you know, I mean, some guy might write a tune on the piano and you're going, that's really nice. And then they take that tune and they arrange it, right? And Rimsky-Korsakov arranges Mussorgsky's pictures in an exhibition and it's almost unrecognizable what he does with all the innovation and creativity. So he's, he should really get a lot of credit. He often doesn't. It's Richard Rogers who gets all the credit. All right, so the, so the production budget, half a million dollars. Just let that sink in, half a million dollars, okay? And this is going to play every week for 26 weeks. I think the only week they don't play it is Christmas, okay? All right, 60 million feet of film, they completed this in 10 months. When you think about the editing that they had to do, because this is an immense amount of video uh, and film that they did here, hundreds of hours, really. Um, they, uh, and they did that in 10 months. So these were extremely hardworking, talented editors who did this. Some of it was good to go. I mean, they didn't need to do much to it. The John Ford, John Ford had shot most of the shots for Midway. They didn't need to do much editing for the John Ford stuff. Okay, but there was a lot of stuff that really needed editing. They also didn't just exploit American film, they exploited film from everywhere else that they could get it from, including the propaganda archives of the Third Reich, the Japanese, and, in, and what hadn't been bombed or burned up in, in Japan, all right? So they exploited all of that. And you'll see some of that stuff that they got from the enemy. So some of the film came from the enemy. They got uh, Leonard Graves to be the uh, narrator, no relation to Peter Graves, who will be sort of a second narrator for the 50th anniversary. I forgot to bring it. I was going to bring you the 50th anniversary DVD set. Um, and they wanted it in newsreel fashion. They wanted it. And so you'll see that. You'll see that. I'm, I'm going to let that do the talking when we get there. And again, Sunday afternoons, 26 episodes from October 26, 1952 to May 3rd, 1953. And I was telling somebody uh, before the thing, if you were driving through uh, the United States through a middle-class suburban town somewhere where people owned TVs, you probably could hear the music I'm going to play in just a second, okay? All right? You could probably hear that music. Again, didn't have a lot of air conditioners then. People had their windows open, all right, uh, during the warm days, particularly when we get to the spring in 1953. Remember, this is deep in the early Cold War, 52, 53. We're not even done with Korea yet, all right, when this thing is being broadcast, all right? But this is, hey, we did it, we've prevailed, we can prevail again. So it's really, so victory at sea is really not about World War II so much as it is about the Cold War. It won all sorts of awards. It won an Emmy, it won a Peabody. It was the highest rated program for that television year. Uh, so needless to say, NBC's gamble paid off, and it paid off big. Later, they condensed parts of it into a film that they syndicated and showed, and it actually went into movie theaters. So if you missed the TV, you could go watch the movie, you know, the condensed, the uh, abridged, condensed version. Rogers received a Distinguished Service Award from the Navy for his score that he had done. I couldn't find out whether Bennett got anything, you know, the, the hidden genius behind the score, Bennett. And then, of course, Richard Nixon, who served as a commander, uh, retired from the, or got out of the Navy as a commander in World War II, but was in the, in the Navy for World War II and in the Pacific. This was his favorite film. Oh, uh, you've all heard about Howard Hughes loved, uh, loved that one movie, I guess, uh, Ice Station Zebra. I think that was it, Ice Station Zebra. Then Nixon was the same. In fact, Nixon would play this all the time in the White House, all right? 
And so he, he loved this. At his inauguration, it came, he turned it on. I think he even played it at his daughter's wedding, all right? So this was Richard Nixon's favorite film. All right, so the music, Victory at Sea, and this is sort of the logo for it, and we're going to bring up the uh, first clip. Okay, let's bring up the first clip. Design for war. Here it is, the theme again. You know, so it's sort of like an overture to a symphony or a, or a musical, and it comes back in the same theme. I mean, you can't be a sailor and, and not have this stir you. Okay, let's stop it there. Okay, so, so... The, the music was intended to elicit an emotional response. Very triumphant, very triumphant. But then when they go, now, design for war, you know, oh, now you've got the, you've got the, the, the TV audience's attention. And then this, this very heavy on the wind, woodwinds sort of score that's kind of flowing like the sea and everything to create this image. Okay, start it back up again. Second clip. German propaganda video that they uh, cut in there. Anybody who's seen Das Boot knows that the Reich was sending their guys out to, to, to take photos from actual U boats. This one, though, is probably staged, uh, although those shots uh, uh, probably uh, trained in. That's great. Ships are sinking. Men are dying. It is September 1939. While German panzer divisions race toward Warsaw, the German Navy, powerful, efficient, its morale high, prepares for a greater, more decisive struggle, the Battle of the Atlantic. Hitler's admirals know that command of the sea means the death of Great Britain and victory in Europe. They also know if the stronger Royal Navy bars the way on the surface, victory may be won in the depths. At the outbreak of war, they begin expanding their U-boat fleet by as much as 1,000% a month. Germany's ablest scientists and technicians concentrate on perfecting the submarine, multiplying its range and deadliness. For fascism to survive, it must kill. Okay, let's stop there. The time has come. And Hitler hurls his U-boats into the Atlantic. Okay, so for fascism to survive, it must kill. So one of the common themes is this is a war against an ideology. This isn't a war against Germans or Italians or Japanese. This is a war against an ideology. Fascism must kill. Note the use of the music, this sinister music, when these guys are engaging in this illegal form of warfare you know, illegal submarine attacks. Now, here's where I kind of put my history hat on and go, well, how well did they get to history here? I mean, that's something we're supposed to do in these presentations is talk a little bit about how well they may have gotten the history. Well, I give them a, about a B on this, all right? I give them about a B. Is the German Navy powerful? No, it is not, okay? A is the German Navy well-trained? Yes, it is. But the 
did the German admirals know that command of the sea was essential in this war? Yes, they did. In fact, they did, ask, they did interviews with the German admirals immediately after, in fact, in some cases, the war wasn't over. They were interviewing German captains and German admirals. And they all said the same thing. C lack of the ability to command the sea lost us this war okay, as the axis. Um, so they get that right. They, the German Navy, though, is not very big. The U-boat the piece here, they bring up the Royal Navy, so they bring the Royal Navy. So this is really about the Royal Navy protecting and helping with victory at sea. So that, hey, we're going to fight communism. We've got to fight it together as allies, right? We've got to be in bed with our allies. So they don't leave the British out of the story. They include them in the story from the very get-go. Um, there were some people that said, well, maybe we should only make this about the Americans. And Solomon said, no, it's got to be about everybody because this was a coalition against the ideology of fascism. This was democracy and freedom versus autocratic fascism, all right? And it prevailed, all right? Uh, one other thing they did get wrong, though, is the Germans don't go to unrestricted submarine warfare right off the bat. So this idea that, you know, war starts in 1939, and as the panzers are racing rather ricketedly and not really as well as everybody thinks they are towards Warsaw, the, uh, the German wolf packs are out there ravaging the North Atlantic. No, the Germans went to war with 40 submarines, and only 20 of them were ocean-going operational submarines. And they went out in, in singles. And so the first happy time was just like World War I. The Germans just catch the British off guard with single submarines. But once those 20 submarines have expended their ammunition and go back into port, you know, they, now the Germans are kind of in a fix. So, so I give it about a B, maybe a B minus. All right, let's go to uh, the uh, next clip, please. But one face is familiar. The world has learned to recognize aggression. Japan is marching. Techniques she has learned so well from the West are harnessed into ideas cultivated in the East. Japan's divine mission to bring the eight corners of the world under one roof. Bushido, the sacred code of the warrior, the glory of conquest. First Japan conquered Manchuria. Later she struck China. Incident after incident, victory after victory, forging her new empire, the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. The world is beginning to catch the ominous sound of a strange new word. Bonsai. But behind bright banners and arrogant words, the Japanese high command ponders a dilemma. To realize the dreams of conquest, the war machine must have the oil of Southeast Asia. Japan has none. With the European powers locked in a war of survival, America's Pacific fleet is the major obstacle to Japanese domination of Asia and the Pacific. The ruling militarists hatch a faithful plan to eliminate the obstacle. Sink the United States Navy. Guns are sighted on Pearl Harbor, the key to America's defense in the Pacific, the headquarters of the United States Pacific Fleet. Japan knows the attack she is planning means war. But if she sinks the principal striking force of the United States Navy, the prize is worth the risk. Such bold designs demand hard study and exact intelligence. Okay, thank you. All right, so I wanted to give you the, the Japanese and how the Japanese are portrayed. Again, note, it's the militarists. It's not the Japanese people. There was some, uh, a couple minutes prior to some of that, there was this really lovely montage they did of Mount Fuji, Japanese working in the rice fields very pastoral, very pacific, and, and Japan is this emerging modern nation. But this message that, hey, you know, they've been infected with these toxic ideas from the West, all right? And not the good West, the bad West. And you can see, you know, the message here is communism is going to infect, you know, that communism can do the same thing. They can infect these otherwise lovely cultures and peoples with their, with their, with their poisonous and toxic ideologies that lead to war and death and fighting. 
All right, well, let's look at some of the good guy stuff, shall we? So we've seen the bad guys, right? Uh, by the way, I would give that a mostly an A minus. It's very well done. The, the Japanese clips, in uh, uh, particularly when they're kind of trying to do the anthropological anthropological and sociological piece for Japan are generally fairly well done. And some of those clips are just superb. I mean, you get to see uh, the Supreme War Council, you get to see Tojo, you actually got to see a map exercise where they were wargaming before one of the big operations on board one of the battleships. They would do that. They would do a war game with umpires and everything, and they would war game their war plan on board the ship, and they'd have umpires say whether they were, and then they'd adjust the plan. Uh, the only time they didn't do that, of course, was Midway. But anyway, uh, <laughs> they, Midway, they, the Americans sank the Japanese fleet, and the umpire said, well, that'll never happen. Let's play the game again. And the Americans will only have one carrier and not three. So anyway, uh, so, so I just wanted to kind of bring some of that up. Well, let's uh, switch to uh, Full Fathom 5, please. Full Fathom 5. And now, Full Fathom 5. Pay attention to the music. It's one of the mini miniature submarines that attacked on, on, on the 77 they captured the British sub The most complex, the most compact, the most deadly ship of war, ton for ton, ever conceived by man as the submarine. No training is more rigid, no training more intense than that of the submariner must fight his battles in prison in a carcass of steel, sailing in the deeps of the world's now water that's a Navy chamber. Difficult practice with the Momsen lung for escaping from wrecked submarines. Rigorous tests these sailors must pass to become full-fledged submariners. Fifty percent of the volunteers will fail. New fleet submarines are built for long-range patrols lasting up to 75 days. Built to cruise 10,000 miles without refueling. When commissioned, they will be named for Fish, Tullyby and Tang, Growler and Gudger, Sea Raven and Skate. On the New England coast, the killer fish are spawned that will eat at the vitals of Japan. <laughs> difference with the German submarines, the happy. This, they're going to do the same thing the German submarines were going to do with all that sinister, foreboding music, except it's all happy. I, there's a point in this where, uh, where they have a brand new submarine. I think it's a Gato class. It gets commissioned. They show it going through the Panama Canal. They show it going from the Panama Canal up to Pearl Harbor to the submarine base up there. And at one point, the African-American mess clerk comes out, and there's this beautiful picture of this resolute African-American on the deck of the submarine as they're uh, on their way to Pearl Harbor to get their load of, of torpedoes to go and sink Japanese merchant ships. So, um, and, and, and so you can already see that the editors are also getting in other messages here. Uh, we saw the Japanese-American who was part of the Pacific Fleet, no less. You know, uh, they tried to put most of the Asian Americans in the European theater, but not all of them went that way. And a lot of them, of course, had language skills, and so they had to have those Americans uh, be part of the solution in the Pacific. But this idea that the military's been integrated, and so they're subtly getting the message across that, hey, guess what? Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, African Americans were part of victory at sea. That's why our ideology, freedom, democracy, civil rights, equal rights, all right? Now, this is before 1964, 10 years, 11 years before it. But, but you can see that they also use this as a vehicle to sort of preach to an internal audience and get them to see that social change was needed in America as well. So I, I, I found that fascinating when I watched this. Um, and I like that last clip where they showed all those American submarines lined up. And, and the first thing I thought of the first time I saw that clip was the German sub pens at Trondheim. 
of all their submarines lined up. Okay, next slide, next uh, clip, please. And now, D-Day. Yeah, it all begins on the water, doesn't it? On June the 6th, 1944, an Allied expeditionary force will invade the continent of Europe. That day must come. January of 1943, the Allies commit themselves to the liberation of Europe, while their soldiers, sailors, and airmen storm the gates of Tripoli. North Africa is yet to be won, but the combined chiefs of staff speak their distant dream to cross the channel, return to the continent. The chiefs of state christen this supreme operation with a noble code name, Overlord. In London, a year later, the Supreme Commander Allied Expeditionary Forces, General Eisenhower, takes up the task of piercing the heart of Germany and destroying her armed forces. But across the narrow English Channel lies the ultimate barrier, Hitler's Atlantic Wall, formidable guardian of Festung Europa, the fortress of Europe. Okay, stop it. All right, so we had to bring the European theater in here. Um, you know, we kind of saw the anti-submarine warfare piece earlier, and this is, this is what that gained for the Allies. And again, the message here for the Cold War audience is, one, allies, uh, and how important allies are. How important Command of the Sea is into supporting NATO. I'm, I mean, an invasion of Europe. Okay, so remember, NATO is just becoming that military alliance when this hits the streets. There are a lot of Americans that are like, wait a second, George Washington said no foreign entanglements. You know, what's this NATO thing? Yeah, I know we're part of the North Atlantic Charter, but a military alliance? All right, so NATO, you know, we, we have this, this false narrative in our heads that NATO has always been a wonderful thing that everybody always thought was a good idea. In the early 1950s, there were a lot of Americans who didn't think it was a good idea. All right, so there's these subtle messages that are contained here inside this. As far as, as, far as the uh, commentary as a historian goes, pretty good, pretty good. There, I mentioned cinema verite. There was a form of filmmaking at the time called cinema verite. It used almost exclusively, even though we had colorized technology, black and white. And the idea is we're going to show life and reality as it really happened. It's really gritty. And so you can start to see some of this. Some of this is, some of the, some of the footage here is just completely, you know, raw footage of real people in extremely difficult circumstances. Those, the faces of those soldiers, I don't know if you could, could relate to, those guys did not look happy, all right? Now, many of them were probably seasick, okay? And victory at sea means you're probably going to get seasick at some point. So, uh, like my friends used to tell me, John, there are those who have been seasick and those who will be seasick. Nobody will ever not be seasick, okay? So, uh, so that's the European piece. Let's go back to the Pacific now, and we can see some more of that, uh, what made Victory at Sea so sort of avant-garde and cutting edge was this gritty portrayal of combat uh, in the environment of the sea. Next, next clip, please. <laughs> And now, conquest of Micronesia. Ranging far, sweeping wide, American warships venture deep into the Central Pacific. Bigger, faster, mightier carriers are the core of the task force destined to destroy the Japanese Empire. Around the carriers, the battleships are ringed. Around the battleships, the cruisers. Around the cruisers, destroyers. It is autumn, 1943. Radically new tactics of the United States Navy's answer to the challenge of World War II.
The immediate targets are the Gilbert and Marshall Islands, scattered for 1,000 miles athwart the equator. Mandated to the Japanese in 1920, the islands are studded with enemy fortifications. Land-based planes cannot reach them. But the Navy's floating airfields audaciously sail into striking range and deliver the blows that lead to invasion, to conquest. homing pigeons, the Hellcats and Corsairs return. Mission accomplished. Marcus Island has been worked over, but the flying sailors will be back. The carriers are nibbling at their prey, preparing for the kill. Pilots make their combat intelligence reports. This information is the blueprint for future assault. After hard-hitting months at sea, the task force returns to base, to Pearl Harbor. Eighteen months ago, the scene of the most humiliating military catastrophe in the history of the United States. Today, Pearl Harbor is the mightiest of bases, sheltering an ever-expanding fleet, ever-increasing assault forces. And only minutes away is Honolulu, a light-hearted haven in the midst of war an interlude for sailors between battles. Well, I was hoping to get us to that, uh, some dreadful images from Tarawa, the Betio Atoll with, uh, with the uh, Marines uh, uh, and the slaughter that took place there. But I think this, this clip is useful because it emphasizes this idea of, hey, you know, we can get slapped around on opening day, but we're back. And, and Honolulu is back to normal, um, and now we've got this instrument uh, that we can fight with. And we don't need airfields. We, we have these floating airfields. We'll just bring our airfields with us, and, and that's how we'll prevail. Um, the, uh, another thing that I meant to say in the previous clip when we were talking about the submarines is the Soviet threat at the time that this was produced was almost entirely regarded as a submarine threat, all right? So the Navy's biggest concerns vis-a-vis -vis, uh, if World War III broke out after nuclear warfare were submarine attacks on sea lines of communication, both in the Pacific by the Soviet Pacific Fleet based in Vladivostok, as well as in the Atlantic by the Soviet fleets based in the Baltic and particularly uh, uh, based uh, over, uh, in the North Cape and, uh, and in uh, the Bering Sea, so or the Bering Sea. So, uh, so I wanted to emphasize that. Let's go to the final clip, and then, uh, then we'll kind of wrap things up. And now, suicide for glory. In the year of 1938, Emperor Hirohito of Japan writes a poem. Peaceful is morning in the Shrine Garden. World conditions, it is hoped, will also be peaceful. The imperial poetry mirrors the Japan that most of the world wants to know. A picturesque land where nature is arranged in graceful patterns, and where people are arranged around the patterns. feudal age whose philosophy is warlike, built on a worship of the nation, of Japan itself. Materially, the Japanese emulate the West, but spiritually, they belong to the East. The Treaty of San Francisco has just been signed. It's actually being signed while this is in production. And, and the Treaty of San Francisco is the peace treaty with Japan. 
And Japan is becoming part of the Cold War alliance. So they're not a full partner yet. Uh, we're going to be in Okinawa again for, for a lot longer. But, but, the, but the occupation of Japan, formally at any rate, is supposed to end. And so I wanted to kind of capture this idea of, you know, making the Japanese into these partners with the West against the enemy. And so, so, so a lot of the clips that kind of go back to the home front in Japan kind of emphasize this is not the Japanese people waging this war. This is really these militarists. And, and even the emperor isn't that bad of a guy, right? He writes poetry. You know, he's a marine biologist. And, uh, and so, uh, so, so the Cold War piece of that, I think, is displayed here. Two, the, the editing, I mean, it's, it's so uh, lyrical to watch these images, the way they put them together. It's a really fascinating job that they did editing. But the, but the impression that it gives the viewers is of, oh, the Japanese aren't so bad anymore, you know. Um, and again, uh, just four years after this is, is over, I was born. And a year after this was over, or a year after I was born, I was in Japan with my family, stationed at Naval, Naval Air Station at Sugi, all right? Um, and my father always loved this film, he, these, these documentaries. Um, and when they did a rebroadcast, uh, when I was a kid, I think they did a rebroadcast in the 60s, a little shorter version, we, we, we sat around and we all watched that with my dad saying, hey, kids, look at that, you know, remember that from when you were, you know, two years old in Atsugi? And I said, yeah, Dad, sure, you know. <laughs> but at that, that image of, you know, the Japanese aren't so bad, the Japanese aren't so bad. During the war, it wasn't that way. I mean, <laughs> during the war, the propaganda portrayed the Japanese as these inhuman, subhuman animals who uh, adhered to this barbaric code of Bushido, you know, the, where they killed prisoners, they raped women and children, and uh, they'd rather commit suicide than surrender, and that they were prepared uh, for Japan to fight to, to the end. They were prepared to fight to the last woman and child, okay, to uh, keep the barbarians out of Japan. Okay, let's, can we bring the, uh, the, the PowerPoint back up again? Let's try and get through the thing. All right, so World War II, amphibious operations, coverage of the war as a global war, Cold War, global war, the way to get there, the sea, all right? It's an away game, all right? So, I, so, so it's not just this narrative of World War II, it's this narrative, it's this information operation primarily targeted at Americans, primarily targeted at tax-paying Americans, okay? And so the final point I want to make is the Americans of that generation, uh, we call them the greatest generation, I call them the World War II generation, and their children, the baby boomers like me, okay, understood sea power in a way I don't think any other generation has understood. One generation understood it almost directly through experience. I mean, look at all the presidents who had, had been in the Navy, uh, Kennedy, Johnson, Ford, Carter, uh, Nixon, uh, Bush. I mean, they understood sea power, but the people understood it too, all right? And so I developed this lecture because I wrote an article in Proceedings, which is the Naval Institute Proceedings for the Forum of the Sea Power, to make an argument, hey, we need something like this again. I don't think Americans understand sea power. You know, a ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal, gets a little bit of attention. This was every week for 26 weeks. Every week for 26 weeks. So, uh, so I'm on my podium now kind of saying, hey, we need to get sea power back out to the masses. Who knows, maybe this video will go viral and, and we'll get everybody interested in sea power. Let me, let me go here. This is, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to neglect my dudes. This is the 50th anniversary DVD. Uh, this is, this is a wonderful, wonderful production. Uh, Peter Graves does it from the deck of the Intrepid in Manhattan. Uh, he gives a nice introduction. He gives you background, context, and everything. So if you've liked this presentation and you want more, uh, Peter Graves, you know, from Airplane and Mission Impossible, he, he'll give you the rest. And by the way, no relation to Leonard Graves. Him and Leonard Graves, uh, the narrator for, the original narrator for uh, Victory at Sea, are not related. Okay, before we go to questions, let me 
pitch the next lectures. Prisoners of War uh, as military intelligence in the Civil War and World War II. So if you like World War II, uh, you're going to get it again, and you're also going to get uh, uh, POWs in the Civil War. And that's going to be two of our uh, professors, uh, Derek Mallet, Mallet, uh, Mallet and uh, Angela Riotto, and that'll be, that'll be on 1 September here at the Dole Center. All right. So I'm going to wait until we can get the uh, microphone out here, and then we'll take questions. Questions? Yes, sir. Just wait for the microphone. Was the film uh, conceived in part as the Navy's making a case for appropriations, uh, particularly with the Air Force being so ascendant in the, the new nuclear war paradigm of the uh, early Cold War? That's a really good question. And it could, I, again, if you didn't hear it, 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 did this have something to do with the Navy trying to get back some budget share? Uh, the Korean War got the Navy budget share back. Uh, the fascinating thing about the timing of this is it kept the budget share there where it needed to be, at least for guys like me who are navalists, right? So, so, so it was very fortuitous. Now, was this a Navy, a Navy budget share operation? No, but the Navy knew a good deal when it saw it. It knew a good PR. The guy running it is a former Naval PR officer, public relations officer. The vice president, Richard Nixon, you know, is, is a big fan. And so, so it, was a very, uh, it was a very fortuitous, serendipitous result for the Navy. And when you look at what happened with the Navy budget in the rest of the 50s, it did pretty good. I mean, Eisenhower came in on a, I'm going to cut defense after we get out of the Korean War presidency in 1952, and then he, of course, went into office in 1953. And, uh, but the Army took the, the big hits in the budget. Uh, the Air Force and the Navy uh, kept their budget share. And this was the period when Arleigh Burke was the CNO. Just shortly after this, Arleigh Burke became the CNO. And this is when we got nuclear-powered submarines and nuclear. And Americans knew what that stuff was. It was like, wait a second. Yeah, submarines, we need those. They're, they're going to have nuclear reactors on them? They're going to have nuclear missiles on them to fight the commies? Yeah. So again, you know, I think the, uh, I think the consciousness raising that this movie uh, caused, not just with the population, but in the polity, was very, very important. Uh, and it, it served the Navy well. The, the Navy, the Na every man hour that the Navy expended in cooperating in the production of this documentary series paid humongous dividends. Yes. Tom, wait for the mic. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there were 60 million uh, feet of uh, uh, film uh, taken of American uh, naval operations during uh, World War II. So, and that maybe 26 hours of it appears here in the Victory at Sea. Uh, my question is, uh, do you imagine that there's a lot of other good footage in there that still hasn't been uh, mined out of that 60 million feet? Okay, so what about the rest of that footage? Yes, and it's not just American footage, it's, it's British footage, it's Italian footage, it's German footage, it's, um, it's uh, Japanese footage. Um, so there's all kind of film that they have. That, it has been mined. There are other people who've gone back. I'm not sure where the film, I think this stuff is held by the National Archives. Um, um, you know, one of the great things about doing this film was they did centralize this resource. Uh, I'm not sure if all the film was protected properly. Uh, uh, one of the things that it did was it prevented a lot of this stuff from being lost to history. But I'm absolutely sure there's probably film that has never been seen before. I did a, a documentary for the Australians on World War II in the Pacific a couple years ago. They, uh, some, some outfit, Wild Bear outfit out of Australia, that had me as one of the talking heads for a documentary that I did. And some of the footage that they had, uh, I'd never seen before. Um, and I was wondering, I, I kind of wondered, I wonder where the, if they got it from where a lot of, the, a lot of this stuff is stored. Um, uh, you know, a lot of it belonged to the Navy. Uh, when, 
in the 80s, I think, the Navy turned over a great deal of this material to the National Archives. So uh, I would hope it's all still centralized, but that's a really good question. That's a really, really... I, I can't imagine that it hasn't been further exploited by uh, uh, enterprising documentary uh, filmmakers. Uh, uh, one of the documentaries that I love to use is something called Wings Over Water. It's a documentary of the history of uh, U.S. American naval aviation. And there's footage in there that's just fascinating. And some of it's the same footage as you see in Victory at Sea. So whoever put that documentary together had access to the same resource as the people at, that put together, at Salomon and the, and the editors that put together Victory at Sea. That's a good question, though. Deserves more research. Yes, sir. Did uh, any of the uh, Victory at Sea uh, episodes show Japanese kamikaze attacks on American ships? So, yes. And actually, that last clip, if we let it run, we would have gotten into the kamikaze attacks. Now, the kamikaze attacks first begin. Now, the Japanese don't call them kamikaze attacks, okay? It's called ketsugo, all right? Uh, special tactics. So it's a special tactic. The campaign is called the ketsugo campaign. Tom, what's the trend? I know go is, is plan, but what is, what is ketsu? Do you remember what that stands for? Yeah, but so it's, the campaign is ketsugo, um, and, and, and they, they consider this a special tactic. So the pilots weren't considered suicides. The Japanese didn't regard this as suicide. They regarded this as a legitimate military tactic where one of the byproducts was the death of the pilot. Okay? Um, and, uh, but the, the film does show that. Uh, in the f on the footage on Iwo Jima, you'll see American, uh, Americans flamethrowing Japanese uh, trying to surrender uh, with flamethrowers on Iwo Jima. So the, it's pretty gritty. There's some really gritty scenes in this. There, there are occasions in Victory at Sea where there's no narration at all. It's just the music and this incredible footage. And you're just sitting there going, I can't believe I'm watching this. You know, you know, it's, you know I'm, I'm watching Americans set prisoners on fire. You know, I'm watching Japanese immolate themselves on battleships, carriers, destroyers, and merchant ships. Okay? So, so it's, that's one of the great things about this documentary. Um, there's so much of it that it's hard to keep the truth from coming out. But you had to pay attention. Okay, you got to pay attention. Okay. I suspect there were a couple times where people got up and turned the TV off. Said, no, oh, let's just wait and see if it gets a little better and then turn it back on again. Okay. Particularly the combat that they show in the Pacific. Uh, I was trying to get to that, but I, I should have forwarded it a little bit more, so I apologize for that. Okay. Anything else? Any questions from the... Oh, Dr. Gerges? Yeah, John... Great talk, and of course, the, the other series you kind of compare it to would be The World at War. Yes. From early 1970s, um, which hasn't necessarily held up really well from a historical perspective. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of the episodes that are, are wanting. Um, looking back at this one, at Victory at Sea, all 26 episodes, can you kind of talk about how well the history has held up? I, again, you have to kind of go episode to episode. You have to remember this is Salomon, not a... Not a now, did he work with a, a legitimate historian in putting together the, uh, the screenplay, as it were, for this? Yes. Uh, was he a historical-minded person? Yes. Uh, but there are certain themes because of the Cold War that sort of subvert the narrative, all right? Um, when... When they're, when they're, like, there's some things, they, they propagate some myths, you know, like the miracle at Midway. Although the Midway chapter is really interesting because the Midway stuff, the footage really runs long. I mean, they try to give you a feel for these long periods of just waiting around for something really bad to happen. And then something bad happening and then it being over in an instant. And now it's, you know, clean up the mess. All right, and and so it does a real good job at that. So, I mean, if you turn off the soundtrack, it's it's an incredible experience. You could almost turn this, you know, you could almost every time the guy starts talking, you know, hit the mute button. All right, and then once he's finished, you know, turn it back on again. The music is lovely. The way the music is scored, 
by by Bennett is is it's probably it's it's an act it's a it's a it's a it's a it's an it's it's really a work of art. It's an act of genius. Bennett was a genius. So I just I'm a musician. So I just I'm really into the way that they used music for this. I thought it was an extremely the only other person that I've seen using this effectively in film was like Stanley Kubrick. I mean this is a really effective use of music to get that effective affective response uh, from the images that they're showing. As far as the script goes, I give it a B. I give it. A, I think it's held up pretty well. Again, it's harder to get thing ro things wrong in this environment uh, uh, because the strategies, the operations and everything at sea are simpler. They're very complex, they're chaos, they're, there's uncertainty and all that, but there's just fewer moving parts in this complex dynamic at sea. It's an, now, once you hit the land and you start going into Iwo Jima and you start getting some of the ground combat at D-Day, at Tarawa, you know, but some of these operations are over very, very quickly. I mean, they land, they subdue the garrison in a couple days, boom, okay. Mm, three weeks later, do it again, you know. One month later, do it again. Uh, maybe one of the weakest elements in Victory at Sea is how it portrays air power. It doesn't do enough to emphasize the critical role of land-based air power in the war at sea. The uh, victory at sea involved air power. You couldn't have had victory at sea without air power. Okay, air power from ships, air power from land bases, air power from seaplanes. So, so air power was. So, you know, if I was going to give it a grade for how it portrays air power, it doesn't. I don't think give you enough of that sort of flavor for air power, um, unless it's carrier carrier air power. A plus, right? But everything else. But I mean, if you noticed in the one clip, they showed how they did the planning, where they did the planning. I mean, these guys in these wash khaki outfits you know, on unair conditioned ships, planning on board a ship on their way to an invasion or a major naval, a covering force for a major naval invasion. And they do a really good job of kind of showing you, you know, just how difficult this was. But the idea was, well, they did it. Well, we can do it, right? They did it. We can do it. If they can do that, we can do that, all right? Okay, we can prevail against this global threat of communism. We did it, you know, we don't have a shooting war yet, you know, but don't worry, if we get into a shooting war, if we don't win right away, that's okay. We still can, okay, all right. Hope I, did I answer your question? Okay. Dr. Bjorgi. Hi. Uh, Shipmate. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I have a question about how was, uh, how does the uh, series handle uh, Douglas MacArthur? Uh, MacArthur was, uh, you know, uh, famous for his Southwest Pacific campaign, liberating the Philippines. Then he serves as, as Emperor of Japan, acting Emperor of Japan. And then uh, he gets uh, fired by uh, MacArthur in the Korean War, and he runs for president in 1952. Um, what do they do with him in this? Yeah, that could be problematic, couldn't it? But it's fascinating. So, so when the early episodes are out, what's happening to Doug MacArthur in the early episodes of Victory at the Sea? Well, he's getting chased out of the Philippines. He's a loser. He's, he's been beaten badly, all right? And then once the election is over, then Doug MacArthur liberates the Philippines and... You know, so, so um, yeah, they sort of portray the MacArthur that you see from the Manchester biography. That's the MacArthur you get, this sort of hagiographic presentation. Um, uh, the, that's, that's another weakness in, in the thing. The, the, you don't get enough of that. You know, the fascinating thing is how magnanimous they are, at least to the Japanese, as their enemies. The Germans, no. The Germans are always these filthy Nazis, right? Uh, but yeah, MacArthur kind of gets that. Hey, but but with, when you look at the chronology, you know, yeah, he, you know, he's losing in the Philippines. That's not going to do anything for him. By the way, by the time the primaries come around, he's a dead letter anyway, because Eisenhower said that that son of a gun isn't going to be president. I'm going to run for president just to keep Doug MacArthur out of the White House, and he does, and he does. Okay, I'm getting I'm getting the high five. Uh, do we have time for one more question, sir? One more question. Uh, microphone, and then that'll be it. Uh, regarding uh, Douglas MacArthur, 
I think there was a meeting uh, with President Roosevelt and some military commanders in the uh, Pacific, and there, MacArthur wanted to invade the Philippines, and the other military commanders said, no, that's not a good idea. But Roosevelt went along with MacArthur. Um, maybe I don't have the... Th the no, you, you have it generally correct. So in the summer of 1944, they're trying to make a decision whether they're going to invade Taiwan or the Philippines. Yeah, the past is prologue, right? And MacArthur, of course, had promised to liberate the Philippines. He said, I shall return. It's an election year, 1944, and the Philippines are American, at least for a little while longer, right? Uh, they were on a, on a trajectory to independence. In fact, there were people in the State Department that said, hey, the way to not go to war with Japan is just give the Filipinos their, their independence in 1935. Instead, we send MacArthur over there to train their army. Um, so that occurs between Roosevelt flies out to Pearl Harbor to settle this. Now, the issue is not between MacArthur and Nimitz and, and MacArthur and Spruance, and it's between MacArthur and Admiral Ernest J. King, whose who's, who's professorship I had for a while. And King wants to invade Taiwan. He thinks he, thinks he can end the war quicker with an invasion of Taiwan. Taiwan will cut the sea lines of communication to the south. Um, and he tells Nimitz, you make sure that, you know, we don't invade the Philippines. Well, MacArthur flies out to Pearl Harbor and browbeats uh, President Roosevelt. Nimitz says, eh, it's not worth it. I'll support MacArthur. So he sort of disobeys his boss, King, and decides to go ahead and say, yeah, we'll support the invasion of, of the Philippines, you know, and, and taking a chance that he's going to piss King off. Uh, and the president comes out of the room at one point and says to one of his aides, he goes, you got any aspirin? That man gives me a headache. MacArthur, not Nimitz. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your kindness and your generosity.